but I'm going to do it in the context of what we've been responding to. Racist murderer shot a young unarmed kid through the heart, tracked him down, went after him, profiled him, confronted him, attacked him for racist reasons because, according to the state, actually, because of ill will and hatred. And that comes from the state's surrogate. That comes from Benjamin Crump and Natalie Jackson. It really starts way back in the beginning. And I'm going to just reference to you how it sort of started so that you get a, a context for where we are today. Now, Crump and Jackson needed a media strategy on March 5th. Jackson brought in Ryan Jewelson, a publicist who had worked with her in a number of high-profile cases. After speaking with Tracy Martin, Jewelson said he would take the job for free and then went to work pitching the story to national media. Crump knew from his experience on the boot camp case that publicity could force officials to act. Uh, to keep the pressure on the special prosecutor that had been appointed now. We're over two million signatures, uh, which is the fastest uh, change.org petition ever in its history. Um, and to also be ready to mobilize uh, when it is a call to action to mobilize, it is one of those things that we pray that an arrest is going to be made in the near future. But if there's no arrest made, uh, by the end of April, then we're going to mobilize a, a May Day, a Trayvon Martin May Day call for help. We believe what has to happen is that we have to continue these media tours to inform the public so that the public will keep the pressure on. There was an online petition to arrest George Zimmerman. That online petition has over two million signatures. This is two million people of all nationalities, all races, and all political affiliations. Two million people who look at this, that, this evidence that is presented and says George Zimmerman needs to be arrested and brought, brought, brought to trial. And as of now, that has not happened. So until that happens, until he's brought to trial, then we will continue to um, put the pressure on. But it would require persuading two people who never stood before a television camera to withstand the spotlight. I got on the phone with Tracy Martin and told him, it's not going to be any fun, but this is the only way to find justice, Juleson said. You're going to have to bear your soul, express your emotions, and inner grief. Martin and Fulton agreed. There's only one problem. At first, the media wasn't interested. Juleson pitched the story to a long list of media contacts. Eventually, on March 7th, Reuters published the story. So, here's what we are starting this with. Crump and Natalie Jackson decided they were going to make this a national media case, as they did other cases, because sometimes there are pots of gold at the end of this case that don't just include criminal justice. They include a lot more than that. So they bring on a publicist to bring out the case. Now, did they bring out the facts of the case? One would truly have hoped, because that would make a lot of sense. But what they decided to do instead was to simply just come up with a selling point. Benjamin Crump on Piers Morgan. Get out of his car in the rain and profile, pursue, and confront Trayvon Martin, and then kill Trayvon Martin uh, in cold blood, even though he was unarmed. This is, in fact, the words of a surrogate for the state. Not saying that they were in a conspiracy, but the reality is what they are doing is presenting the state's case. Crump, of course, argues that the entire Sanford Police Department is racist. Matter of fact, he goes on to state, in effect, that the state attorney's office is racist because they wouldn't prosecute. So what he does say, again, to Pierce Morgan, we don't know why the powers that be at Sanford Police Department and the state attorney's office have conspired to sweep the murder of Trayvon Martin under the rug. Mr. Crump disputes the evidence, doesn't exist, and agrees that there's an attempt to cover up the SPD investigation. And what does he say? Tampa Bay Times article. 
In court, you have a jury, Crump says, our job is to get the case to a jury. We need to fight first in the court of public opinion. The jury is the American people. His plan is to completely sway national public opinion on this case in favor of his client, the Martin family, to allege their story that my client committed a heinous act of murder. He has decided to take a story, and I would argue to you, spin it. Because he says, for example, and, and I'll, again, the video clip is available, but basically what he says is when the, the, a video was leaked um, by the same media company that Mr. Crump was with during an interview of a heretofore unknown witness. But anyway, a media video, a police video was leaked by the media showing Mrs. Zimmerman walk past a camera. And he uses that to say, the cops are conspiring against my client. It is obvious there are no injuries on Mr. Zimmerman. And therefore, they're racist, and this is a conspiracy. What's interesting, however, is that when we fast forward to the state's press conference, and they tell us in the press conference that Mr. Crump and Mr. Parks are in daily contact with them since their involvement in the case. I want to especially thank Mr. Crump and Mr. Parks, who have stayed in touch daily with us on behalf of our victim's family. That means that they were involved with them when Mr. Zimmerman's medical records were disclosed to Sanford PD because they had them by March 2nd. So it would seem, since they had daily contact with the investigation, that Mr. Crump would then be aware of the records that suggested the injury to the face and the back. They were similarly aware then, because SPD have it, of the picture of Mr. Zimmerman in the police car with the blood on his nose and on his face, and also the pictures taken at Sanford PD with the blood on the back. I mentioned that not to talk to you about a whole bunch of blood, but when we are looking at what Mr. Crump and his camp have done to this case, it is particularly relevant for us to look at the environment into which Mr. Zimmerman was thrown. Since his involvement in March, they have traveled the countryside, traveled the nation, the Martin family, and Mr. Crump and Ms. Jackson, and, and again, sort of their entourage. And they have pitched this very same story across America that Mr. Zimmerman is a racist murderer. I contend to you that the case against Mr. Zimmerman was created for reasons far outside the facts of what happened that night. When I sit down with a Sanford police officer and he tells me that everybody in Sanford Police Department from the chief to the investigator and the other 11 or 10 in between made the decision that there is not sufficient evidence to try this case, to charge this case. And he also tells me that the state attorney's office was involved in that situation for the last week of that decision-making process, and they too agreed that there was not enough evidence to even charge this case. And then when I see that what was planned in that, and now that we're finding out this discovery, what was planned was a presentation to the grand jury, which you would think would be an appropriate way to handle a case of this magnitude and maybe this concern. When that decision is then taken away from the local state attorney by the governor and given to an out-of-area prosecutor who then doesn't avail themselves of the grand jury process, and I've made this in a motion before, and he reminded me in his response that they don't have to, and I get that. They could charge it with whatever they want. But when that decision is made not to even take it to a grand jury, and I sit back and I say to my client, there's something afoot here. There's something afoot well beyond what he did that night. And what that is, is political influence. And I don't say that just because Gentile says that if it's political speech, it's further protected. Tell me where the facts don't support that everyone who looks at this case initially doesn't think it should be charged, and yet, Lo and behold, the governor involves himself in the process, and we have a second-degree murder charge under these facts. 
I contend to you, just as Gentile contended to his public, that he has an absolute right, not right, the obligation to balance what has been done to Mr. Zimmerman. And I know that you've read through the Gentile, and I highlight some of the comments that say, the Supreme Court noted that Gentile's speech, and let's not forget, Gentile's speech was, this is a cover-up. The cops actually did it, and they're making my guy the scapegoat. Now, I'm not saying cops did that tonight, but uh, did that that night. But the reality is, there is at least questions now from the deposition of one witness um, as to what the true motivation was. And when we look at Gentile, it tells us very specifically that we have the absolute right to comment on that. Supreme Court stated, there is no question that speech critical of the state's power lies at the very center of the First Amendment. Nevada, in that case, seeks to punish the dissemination of information relating to alleged government misconduct, which only last term we described as speech, which has traditionally been recognized at li as lying at the core of the First Amendment. It would be difficult, they go on to state, to single out any aspect of government of higher concern and importance to the people than the manner in which criminal trials are conducted. And they say that it is, in fact, the press in Shepard versus Maxwell, an excellent case for looking at the, the, the need for the press involvement. The press guards against the miscarriage of justice by subjecting police, prosecutors, and the judicial processes to extensive public scrutiny and criticism. Public awareness and criticism have even greater importance where, as here, they concern allegations of police corruption. And as I say in the top of page three of my memo, I, I do not want it to be uncertain that over the last several weeks, it has become apparent to Mr. Zimmerman that there is something afoot here. And we should not be stopped from doing at the very heart of the First Amendment, which is to bring that to light. And we know that because 72% of the people seem to have bought the story hook, line, and sinker already. And that's what we're trying to fight against. So further, um, when we look at what Gentile did, and what, they, what he said. The court summarized his desires, Gentile's desires, by saying rather than it being an admission that he sought to materially prejudice an adjudicated proceeding, petitioner sought only to stop a wave of publicity that he perceived as prejudicing potential jurors against his client and injuring his client's reputation in the community. Let's, just for a moment, let's think about Mr. Zimmerman's reputation in his community today. He's been in hiding. Well, let's back up just a little bit. He was in hiding, then he involved himself every time the police wanted him to come in. He gave in, he came went in, back into the state when they wanted him to. He gave several statements. There'll be arguments over whether or not there are inconsistencies, but he voluntarily gave several statements, took a voice dress analysis, did a recreation of the scene, did a, a voice where he would act out when he screamed for help that night. He was acting it out again so they can try and compare it. He did everything they wanted him to do. And what's his reputation in the community today? Well, we'll get to that in just a moment um, as to what people think of Mr. Zimmerman, why 72% of the people think he won't get a fair trial, and why today he's wearing a bulletproof vest and living in hiding. So, if Gentile is to be given life in this courtroom, then let's give life to the very words of the Supreme Court when they tell us that responding to that tidal wave of information against Mr. Zimmerman is not only appropriate, but the Supreme Court says that's exactly what we're supposed to do. An attorney's duties, they tell us, do not begin at the courtroom door. 
He or she cannot ignore the practical implications of a legal proceeding for the client, just as an attorney may recommend a plea bargain in a, or a civil settlement to avoid adverse consequences and possible loss after trial, so an attorney may take reasonable steps to defend their client's reputation and to reduce the adverse consequence of indictment, especially in the face of a prosecution deemed unjust or commenced with improper motives. A defense attorney may pursue lawful strategies to obtain dismissal of the indictment or reduction of charges, including an attempt to demonstrate in the court of public opinion that the client does not deserve to be tried. Genteel, 1043.